And this is Tricia Wells interviewing Norman Short, formerly of the Rochdale Hornets. Um, so Norman, first of all, can you just tell us a little bit about how you got into the game long before you actually ended up signing for Rochdale? Well, I were, all, I were always a football football man at the time, and I just got talking to my friends and my mates, and they were playing rugby, and they asked me, I could run a bit at the time, so they asked me, would I go back to game with rugby with these? So I joined with playing with these, and I joined the team up there, we were playing for that, with Vicky Shakolowicz at the time, and I got playing with them, and we had some good times, and got some victories and everything. And then after that, I signed for another team called Lee Spinners and from there on I got picked for the Lee Town team and we played again Rochdale on it and we beat them 52-0 and the director from Rochdale on it were watching me and they asked me would I like to come for trials to Rochdale so I said yeah fair enough I'll come and you know so I carried on from there. So, can you tell tell me how that the signing up process were actually worked? What actually happened? Yeah. Well, what it was, they asked me to go for trials at Rochdale, and I was playing in the first trial, and the bloke what to me, Ginger Johnston, we called. He was an old ex-player who, who was running after this Lee Spinners team, and he he came with me to Rochdale and I, on my first trial, and he come in the dressing room at half time and said. Tell me, mate, what's going on? He said, they want to sign you at half-time, you know. So I said, do what? Sign me. He said, oh, I'll, I'll flabbergast it. Anyway, I went on, finished the game. And then that was it. I went home. And the director came to our house the following morning, Sunday morning. He brought all the forms and all that. And uh, he had me to sign all the forms and put my £200 on the table and every, every, all my brothers and mothers and that, their eyes popped out of the bed when they saw all that money in 1950. <laughs> <laughs> so can you just tell, tell me a bit about how you, how you actually um, ended up going to work down the pit and, and what happened uh, a little bit before that? Uh, well, I, I was serving my time as a painter and decorator and I, and I finished my time and in the, about 1957, no, 51, she'll say, 50. And then I got my calling up papers to go for my medical for the, to go in the army to do my two years national service. So I went to be to Manchester for my medical, and there I were, at Great Juicy Street, I think it was called in Manchester at the time. And I said, got in the office there and waited and waited and waited. And they were looking at taking taking some tests on me and all that. And I waited. I must have waited all day. It come about five o'clock at night, not, and nothing had happened. So I went to knocking on the door and to find out what's going on. I said, "Oh, you can go home now, but you, you failed. You've not passed." <laughs> I said because I think they've got flat feet. <laughs> and uh, I heard a bit more after, and they just got a letter and said, "That's it." So from there on. I went home and that me up. We were we playing. A friend, a man, he, he, he was a, knew a manager at the, the pit, and he got me a job at the, the pit at Bickershaw. So I started in the pit then in 1951, 52. Um. So there you are. You've signed for Hornets. Can you can you just talk a bit about the what sort of training regime you had, if there was yeah. one? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and how all that went? Well, when I first started to go train for Rochdale, I thought, oh, how am I going to get to Rochdale? He said, well, you have to make your own work. Oh, I went, so I used to catch a bus from Lee into Manchester and walk across to the Victoria Station and then catch a train into Rochdale Station. Then from there, I used to walk it to the ground, which were about a mile, two mile along, walk, walk to train every Tuesday and Thursday. And then do the same coming back home. So it meant 12 o'clock at night sometime when <laughs> we're getting back home. You know, ridiculous. And were you, were you given any kind of um, dietary regime that you had to follow? Were you told something that you had to do or not to do? No, I used to just turn up for training and we just joined in all together and we all more or less did the same type of thing. 
doing sprinting. And then we did a few laps to warm up first, and then we had this, a bloke that did the sprinting for us, and he, he, he was coaching us, and we did a bit of sprinting up and down, and that went all, all worked, like, you know. But nothing like it is today, all this muscle job and all that. It was just a matter of speed with me. <laughs> So there was a, a particular little routine that you used to have when you played up at Workington. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah, when we went to, to Workington and Whitey, we all had to get to Chorley and pick a coach up from with the other parts of the team. Well, we all used to meet there. And then we used to carry on to Workington and Whitehaven for the game. And when we got to about Keswick, we stopped for a bit of lunch and we all had... Uh, always steak with egg on the top them days, <laughs> which were pretty good for us. And then we used to, after a while we used to catch the coach bike. And then about, when we got about a mile away from the, the ground, everybody had to get off the coach, everybody off. And we all walked behind the coach right through to the ground. And we carried on then. But it didn't do us any good though, because we never, very rarely we won, up, won, up, won when we got up that ground. <laughs> you know. So coming to Rochdale from Lee, and you carried on commuting really to Rochdale for quite a few years. Yeah, yeah. Was was there anyone else from Lee that that sort of helped make you feel a bit more at home? Well, not at the first. I was on my own. But for the first two years, I, I just came. I travelled on my own, and then another lad came. Three uh, Les Jones came. Then he was from Lee. He was a good friend of mine. We used to play together when we were young. And then there's some more came, Morris, Morris Gallagher came, and then Jerry Owens. So we, we kind of got together then. And they said, oh, we're not coming out buzz and travel. So we organised to get a taxi, and the club paid for it. So we, we, about five of us coming, it was worth paying, getting a taxi. So we started coming a taxi around 1955, something, 50, 54, 55, which was a lot easier. <laughs> a lot easier than this. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. So, um, you were at Hornets for quite a few years. Oh, yeah, about 14 years. You were, 14 years. You were at the Hornets for, with the Hornets for 14 yeah. years. Um, there must have been some really great moments. Can you tell me some of your highlights? Yeah, well, I used to play quite a bit, and then I was always an admirer of Wigan, really. And to win at Wigan was something. We went to one at Wigan one year. And that was, that was the very first time we won at Wigan, and that was a quite an achievement for me. Anyway, all for the team, actually, really, to win at Wigan, because they were the team of the moment. Well, they always are, have been the team of the moment, Wigan. Yeah, that were good. And then the next the, other, the next one that stands out to now, when we had a, a good cup run, we, we went, went to all to play at all. We didn't, nobody gave us a chance to win there. And we finished up winning there, which was a surprise to everybody. Then we, we carried on again. We won it. We won it next one again. York we beat York, and then the next one again was Bradford. Which we beat them, and we got to the semi-final. We were treated like blooming lords, celebrities them days. We were unheard of. We, we, to us, it were something different altogether. And then unfortunately, we, we got to Wigan in the semi-final, and we lost. And that was a big disappointment to my life. I mean, rugby, I think that really. Everybody was choked up to death, they were, you know, it was terrible that. So then, after that, we just carried on playing and let things go along as the best we could and carried on. Then another coach came along, Jim Sullivan from Wigan. He was a big name in rugby league at the time, he a big Welshman. He had a good name yet before the war and all that. And he trained Wigan for quite a number of years. And he came, and he, and he seemed to break the, our team up. What we had in the fifth, in the semi-final, and that, and one or two left after that. And after that, I kind of, kind of drifted out of game in a bit, just catching team in and off when he was there, and I just plodded on then, all for the best. <laughs> So can you just um, tell us a little bit more about when the Horn Hornets got almost all the way through to the Challenge mm -hmm. Cup? Oh, everybody were talking about it. They couldn't, couldn't let it drop. Well, like I said, we were treated like celebrities. Everybody, were, the press were coming to, round to the ground every training night, watching us train. And 
and everything. They were, giving, they were getting, asked for interviews and all sorts going on. We, we, there were more crowds watching us train up at that. When we were training, were, some of the teams were getting respect when the matches were on. <laughs> yeah, we were going, yeah. We were, uh, we were going, yeah. didn't meet them anyway. But, yeah. So after, after you'd been playing for the Hornets about, about five years or so, that's when the Fijians came. That's when Arthur Walker brought the Fijians. The Fijians, oh, yeah, about 19... 60, I think yeah. it was when they, then they came, yeah. So there was something different when they came. We, we never heard of it. We didn't know where Fiji were. <laughs> we didn't, anyway. Anyway, when they came, they, they came to Manchester Airport, they still came in the, 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 the gear what they wore when they were in Fiji. And we were there with big overcoats on and freezing cold, and they were there with the slip flops on the coats. And <laughs> anyway, they finished up, finished getting old army coats on for them. And, and they fitted them up with them, and then they, they come to, they come to back to Rochdale with the directors then, and that was it. So the Fijian players are much, you know, much bigger, really big guys. How how was it playing playing with them? How did that go? Oh yeah, they, they were a lot, lot physical there. Well, but, but playing with them, they were great. They were good. They were good footballers. The first two I played with was Joe Lavula and Arisi Dwyer. They were really good class players when they were younger. So well, they, they were a bit too old when they came over. But they were really good class players and they fitted into the team like anybody else, you know. They were good. And, uh, so one of those first Fijians um, was Arisi. Um, and unfortunately he, he died young, didn't he, while he was still a teammate yeah, of yours? Yeah. He, he got an infection on his chest and he went into hospital and, that, and he never came out of hospital after that really. He just died very, very sudden really. It was, it was shocking, everybody was shocked about that because he, he was kind of a bit of a, how, I, how can I say it, a, a bit of a leader in the Fijian community in Fiji, like a commissioner or whatever they call it, you know. And he was like the chief when he came here, and he looked after him, you know. And uh, everybody was sad about that. And Joe carried on playing, just normal after that. But and then it, it, after after well, he died, pretty young and all. Joe he died not long ago after that, because that two, them two went pretty quick when they were here. So just everybody was sad about that. So when the Fijian players came over, um, they were a little bit older, weren't they, than the rest of you on the team? Yeah, a little bit, I should say. About ten years older than us. <laughs> Most, well, more than ten years. Because we found out later, Arisi Dwyer, he was the, the main leader of the Fijians, they could call it, and he was nearly 40 when he came. And I think Joe was only a little bit younger, because when he was young in, in early 50s Joe was one of the top players in, in Fiji he was treated like a god over there and it, 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 was, um, it was right surprised when he ca came here the difference in the everything the climate and everything and, and, and he died not, not long after, after Arisi died you know it didn't take long yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't appreciated that, that there was that age difference. Well, they were a good social side. They, they got a brass band, a, a oh, tin band. you keep band. saying the best bit is where I've turned it off. <laughs> can you, ta can you tell me that bit? Yeah. Um, and what about outside of playing? How, yeah. how was it? Yeah, they, they were good, the Fijians. Before the, all this happened, they, the, one or two more came over and they all got together and they, and they, they formed a... A what's it band, a rock group band going on, and they were going around to different pubs and clubs playing all this. Everybody was mad about them. And yeah, one bloke said, and they said to him, How much do you want? And the Fijians said, Because they used to like a bit of beer at the time, but liquid they used to call it, you got to drink plenty liquid. And they said to the landlord, No, we'll just have the beer, just keep flowing the beer, we'll have the beer on play. And I said, oh, that sounds all right to me. But after they've played and gone, and he, he checked up on his, all his takings and that, he said, blow my neck. I said, I wish I'd have paid them money. He said, they, they, they drunk me dry. <laughs>
So t- tell me about socialising with the Fijians. Yeah, we used to go out drinking on night and all that. We used to, if you went drinking with them, you, you, you had to be careful how much you drank because they were drinking five drink, five pints of you too. <laughs> well, I always remember one game we played at Blackpool, one of the very first games they played with the A team in the first team. And we went to Blackpool and after the game, we said, oh, we'll have a night out in Blackpool. And the court said, you lads, look after these Fijians because they're not used to drinking and anything over. So he said, look after them, not watch they don't do any trouble. So we got for a drink in the, one of the pubs in Blackpool. We'd had a few, and the Fijian, one of the big, Joel Lavula, he said, he, he must have had about 12 pints then, and we were struggling. And he said, right, let's start on the top shelf. No, I've never had enough beers. <laughs> and, and they were only them sober, and we were all wobbling about. <laughs> and he said, don't, they're not used to drinking. <laughs> So, um, 14 years after playing yeah, for, for the Hornets for 14, 15, 15 years, years. How, how, how did it end? How did you come to the decision to, to finish playing after 15 years? Well, I, I got injured in one game. Many went, one, of the, one of the opposition players landed on my knee and, and I felt it go. It felt something snap in my knee. And after that, I, I tried to get it right. So I, I left the game for about 12 months to rest in and all that. Next, the first game I started after that, and it, the first 10 minutes it went again, so I left it alone again for 12 months. And they said, why don't you ever try in the A team? So I, I did play a few games in the A teams, but it still went again. And then I, I, I gradually just decided that that would be it. I had to break down not playing again, but time comes and when you got to finish so I decided that be, that's it then so I give over then I did I, did, I didn't I started doing a bit of scouting for the for the team at the time for Rochdale Hornets I just landed, did a bit for that at the time but after that I just backed it in I finished, I finished then so so ha- so when you finished how old were you and and what did you do next well I was about 34 then at the time so I went back painting and decorating, which had served me time for, and I got a job with somebody I knew, and he, and he set me up working with them, and I went working with them for quite a while. So I carried on with painting, and that's all I did after that. Just kept painting and decorating for the rest of my career and my life. Still, I'm still painting now and again. <laughs> bits and bats. <laughs> Not a lot, but bits. So... After after being such a player for fifteen years, how did you keep that that connection going with the Hornets? Oh yeah, I kept going up to the ground and watching, and keep meeting up with it, some of the players, past players, and all that. I enjoyed it. And then one of the lads, I think it was Bert Chall and Tony Pratt and Mick Baxter and Starker, they, they decided to form a past players association, and from then on, everybody keeps meeting and it's gradually increased in number and it's doing very well at the moment and that's when we keep meeting old players and meeting together we meet every so often and we have a reunion every 12 months which is very good which usually attracts about 200 past players from different clubs and and that and it's really really good done well so tell us about the that that Dewsbury game what happened there Oh, well, I was playing there and we were playing. Well, I was pretty well known at the time for my speed and and that. And they used to always say, watch him there and watch him there. And that was how it used to be. Anyway, somebody did watch me. They caught me and they cut. And they gave me such a whelp. They cut all my eye open and split it open. Anyway, I had to go off because I was bleeding. And uh, I went into the dressing room. The doctors always used to come with you. I think it was called Dr. Vining at the moment. And he got me on the table, stretched it up, and then he stitched me up and put the, the towel around my head and put a big bandage round him and he got me right and said, where are you going? I said, well, go back on the pitch. He said, go back on the pitch then. And one of the blokes, one of the players, he said, 
No, my neck, that's finished you for the rest of the game. I, put him, I proved him wrong. I went back on. I went on there and I scored a couple of more tries. And we won the game and that, that, that surprised him.